Um, good morning, my name is Eric Owens, and I'm the Associate Director of the Boise Center for Religion and American Public Life, and it's my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you to this very special day of events in honor of our founding director, Alan Wolf. Alan's long and distinguished career as a sociologist, political scientist, teacher, advisor, essayist, author, and public intellectual begins a new chapter at the end of this academic year when he retires from teaching at Boston College and leaves the directorship of the center he started in 1999. We are joined today in this celebration by many of Alan's closest friends, collaborators, and interlocutors who are, as it were, also among our country's most incisive and prescient thinkers on the role of religion in American public life. You have traveled from far and near to be here with us today, and I welcome you and thank you for joining us. I'm also delighted to welcome Jeff Boise back over here, who, with his wife, Reen, both 1969 graduates of Boston College, made the extraordinary gift in 1999 that created the Boise Center and sustains it today. Jeff's vision and commitment continues to inspire our work at the Boise Center, and we thank him for everything he continues to do for Boston College. Jeff will be speaking this afternoon during the 3 o'clock program uh, at the reception following the academic conference today, and details of that are at the bottom of your program. Finally, I'd like to welcome and bring to the podium the other essential figure in the Boise Center's origin story, if you will, Father William Leahy, SJ, 25th president of Boston College, and the leader who recruited Alan away from our rivals down the street at Boston University to serve as the Boise Center's first director. Thank you for joining us and for saying a few words of welcome. Let me add my welcome to all of you for being here this morning as we recognize the contributions of Alan Wolf, but also what has gone on at the Boise Center for Religion and American Public Life all these years. And as I think about what has happened at Boston College through this center since 1999, I got thinking about the origins and evolutions but also the impact of the center and origins. I'd only been here, I was in my third year when I recall Father Bill Neenan, the Vice President for Academic Affairs coming to me and saying that he had been in conversations with Father Bob Barth, who was the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, about the possibility of attracting somebody I didn't know at all, Alan Wolf and that Boston College should think about establishing a center that would somehow engage broad issues around religion and society, religion and public life. And so those conversations with those two Jesuits, plus Ben Birnbaum, who is at BC still, the Executive Director of Marketing and Communications, led to, in some ways, shuttle diplomacy because there were conversations with the academic side at BC conversations with Alan about what he wanted to do. And then there was the issue about funding. How would we move forward with this concept of a center that would engage these large issues? And what we were working on was that there would be a venue at Boston College with strong academic leadership that would take up major issues and do it in a way that was open, that invited dialogue. And so we knew that we had a director that could provide that kind of leadership and engagement. Then we needed to work on how would we fund this. And as Eric mentioned, Jeff and Reen Boise were the two that provided that kind of funding that enabled us to establish what you know today is the Boise Center for Religion and American Public Life. So we got ourselves launched, and then you'll hear more today about specific aspects of the center, but I think about the range of issues that have been discussed at Boston College through this center. And I think as I look back on what the center has added to intellectual discourse at Boston College and how it has helped us stand tall in the American academic world. It's around discussion, engagement, framing issues, 
and then producing materials, either Alan has done at least 10 books since he's been here at Boston College, numerous articles, and then some of the seminars that have been held here in the last 17 years have been significant. And as you enter into your day, I think you'll grow an appreciation of the impact of what has been accomplished here at the Boise Center. And then, of course, Alan, as an individual, such a presence on our campus. This, this concept of a public intellectual, someone who analyzes, who's reflective, who is articulate, and is able to bring others to discussions. I like the, the topic that you're engaged in today, the calling of the public intellectual. If there's ever been a time in our world where we need someone, some group, some types of individuals who can help us engage and resolve very difficult issues, whether it's around religion in American public life, but religion in terrorist activities, how we are going to go forward with a political scene in the United States, but also really in so many parts of the world where there is division, where there is violence. We need individuals who can help us as a culture frame these issues and then move toward resolution. And to say that that's a calling, all the religious overtones of that word, calling, I think it is a calling. And the Boise Center and Alan Wolf and you as individuals who participate in those discussions have certainly advanced life and I think also the ways in which we live together. And so you will be engaging in your discussion today. I look back on, Al, on your time at BC and that presence. The, when we were starting the church in the 21st century, I remember in asking you to help us as we were dealing with the issues surrounding sexual abuse in the Catholic Church and how would the Catholic Church respond to issues of the day. Alan brought perspective to that. That was very valuable. So today I remember things. I also give thanks. And Alan may say he's retiring, but he'll always be here. He'll always be with us. And that enduring legacy, long as your wife will cooperate, we're in good shape. Not to worry. So I applaud what you're doing here today. I like the topic, the calling of a public intellectual. I think it's so appropriate. And Eric, I'm going to turn this group back to you, and you can move forward because we have these distinguished individuals over here who are anxious to share wisdom. Thank you all. Thank you, Father. Um, when we first started thinking about how to celebrate Alan's work um, and his tenure at the director of the Boise Center, I did, you know, the usual steps of planning. Uh, but first of all, the skywriter that I hired said there was no way he could spell out all the titles of Alan's books. It would take him a month to do so, and the wind would blow them away too quickly. My second option was uh, rejected outright by the fire marshal, the fireworks and laser show, which they said would ruin the building. And then um, uh, it turned out that the cost to hire singers from Alan's uh, beloved Metropolitan Opera were also prohibitively expensive. So, so then it dawned on me what I should have started with, which is the perfect idea of uh, celebrating with modeling the kind of conversations that Alan has done so skillfully over the many years to host a series of incisive, rigorous, passionate conversations among scholars who are both deeply informed by research and deeply committed to the common good of our society. So that's what we have for you today in three sessions here in the beautiful Gasson Hall. The first session is entitled Return of the Study of Religion in Law and Political Science. And we have four exceptional scholars who will consider the curious path of scholarship about religion within academia, and especially the social sciences, over the past four or five decades, and then extend their conversation to a wide array of current issues in public life. The second session, entitled Public Scholarship Today, brings four more terrific scholars and public intellectuals together to consider what it means to be both of these things, a scholar and a public intellectual. 
We're using the term public scholar here to signal that there might be something different about public intellectuals whose work is backed by deep and rigorous scholarly research. And this panel will let us know by talking about the issues they cover in their own scholarly and public work. After lunch, we will reach the keynote conversation between Alan Wolf and Howard Gardner, longtime friends and fellow travelers as public intellectuals and scholars. And afterward, we invite every one of you and the whole Boston College community to join us at the Boise Center at 24 Quincy Road for um, a reception uh, and also a three o'clock program with personal remarks from folks at the Boise Center as well as Alan and our patron Jeff Boise as well. So we have a terrific schedule of events lined up for you and I hope you'll stick around for all of them. At this point, I'd like to invite the speakers for our first panel to come up and grab their seats. I'd act, like to ask that uh, all of us here uh, turn off the ringers on your cell phones so that we're not interrupted in the middle of the process. Um, but you don't have to put your cell phones away because our staff and hopefully every one of you here will be tweeting throughout the whole process <clears throat> and um, on social media throughout the day. So we invite you to find the Boise Center on Facebook and Instagram and especially Twitter. Finally, I'd like to say a, a quick thank you to the Boise Center staff for all the work you guys have done uh, over the past year and 18 months, really, especially Suzanne Hevelone and Susan Richard, uh, but also Kyle Logan, Hamid Aladati, Max Blaisdell, Connor Farley, and Nathan McGuire. All of you have been terrific and have put in many hundreds of hours to make this work. Our moderator for our first session today is Professor Susan Meld Shell. Professor of Political Science and Chair of the Political Science Department here at Boston College. And she'll be leading our conversation uh, with these other distinguished scholars whom I will let her introduce to you. So please join me in welcoming our first panel. Well, it's a pleasure and honor to welcome you all to this celebration of the Boise Center and to Alan's tenure here. Um, the term public intellectual conjures a variety of images mainly positive, but also sometimes negative, and could well have been a panel topic in itself. The calling of a public intellectual, to echo uh, Father Leahy's um, moving words, as distinguished from that of a scientist or politician or a journalist, to borrow Mike Weaver's formulations, is a question, um, one that the title of this conference, I think, calls on us to ponder. What do you specialize in, a distinguished public intellectual was once asked. His reply, generalizations. <laughs> well, I'm sure we'll have more than mere generalizations on this panel. Um, our distinguished panelists include uh, Richard Mao, Ira Katzenstein, and Sandy Levinson, and we'll be discussing the return of the study of religion in law and political science, something that I think maybe surprised some of us or would have surprised some of us 20 years ago, but hardly surprises us now. Richard Mao served as president of Fuller Theological Seminary from 1993 to 2013, and presently serves on the Fuller faculty as professor of faith and public life. Prior to joining the Fuller faculty, he taught in the philosophy department at Calvin College. He's also served as a visiting professor at the Free University of Amsterdam. Mao's many books include, and these, the titles are just make you want to just run, run out and read them. Um, the God Who Commands, The Smell of Sawdust, Calvinism in the Las Vegas Airport, Uncommon Decency, Christian Civility in an Uncivil World, and most recently, Call to the Life of the Mind. He has received several awards, including the Princeton Theological Seminary's 2007 Corporate Prize for Excellence in Reformed Theology and Public Life, and the Shalom Award for Interfaith Cooperation from the American Jewish Committee. He recently served as president of the Association of Theological Schools and co-chaired for six years the official Reformed Catholic Dialogue. Ira Katznelson is currently the Ruggles Professor of Political Science and History at Columbia University since 2012. He's been president of the Social Science Research Council. His book, Fear Itself, The New Deal and the Origins of Our Time, has been awarded the Bancroft Prize in History, the Woodrow Wilson Foundation Award in Political Science, and the Sidney Hillman Foundation Prize for Book Journalism. Other recent books, and there are many others, include Liberal Beginnings with Andreas Kalavas, When Affirmative Action Was White, and Desolation and Enlightenment. Katz Nelson has served as president of the American Political Science Association, the Social Science History Association, 
and is a research associate at Cambridge University's Center for History and Economics. Sandra Levinson holds the W. St. John Garwood and W. St. John Garwood Jr. Centennial Chair in Law and a Professor in the Government Department at the University of Texas at Austin. This year, he's a visiting professor at the Harvard Law School. His many books include Constitutional Faith, Our Undemocratic Constitution, Where the Constitution Goes Wrong and How We the People Can Correct It, Framed, America's 51 Constitutions and the Crisis of Governance, um, and, and an argument open to all, reading the Federalists in the 21st century. He's also the editor of Torture, a collection, and the co-editor with Mark Tushnet and Mark Graebner, uh, Graeber of the Oxford Handbook of, uh, on the United States Constitution. Levinson received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Law and Court Section of the American Political Science Association in 2010. So each of our distinguished speakers will speak for about 10 minutes, um, and uh, then there'll be conversation among the panelists followed by questions and conversation from the floor. So without further ado, Professor Mao. Thank you, it's uh, great to be here. Many of you know that Alan uh, recently in the New Republic uh, reviewed uh, David Oppenheimer's book, uh, Exit Right, and he concluded that review by uh, saying that while American politics uh, seems to have reached new lows these days, uh, it's a pleasure to be reminded that ideas do matter and that those who devote their lives to them are doing something worthwhile. And it's great to be here to celebrate the, the great contributions of the center and Alan Wolf in particular to the cause of uh, seeing to it that ideas do matter. And especially in this case, ideas about uh, religion. Uh, we're talking in this session about the return of the study of religion to uh, the study of politics and law. And uh, return is actually a, a poignant uh, uh, turn, uh, term in this case. Uh, in 1993, the uh, Oxford-based uh, Blackwell Company uh, published a, a book that bore the title A Companion to Contemporary Political Philosophy. The book had uh, almost seven pages in length and it featured a number of uh, very helpful essays on a variety of political topics, but there was almost nothing, almost nothing in the book about religion. And it turns out that the omission was intentional. Uh, the editors uh, told us, uh, as they introduced the volume, that they deliberately avoided any treatment of such things as, and these are their words, theism, monarchism, and fascism, because whatever impact they once had in public life, they would seem to play only a marginal role in the contemporary world. That's really an amazing <laughs> statement, and they have somewhat uh, redeemed themselves by uh, actually including uh, a number of political uh, religion and political uh, topics, the relationship between religion and politics in the most recent uh, uh, edited version of that volume. Um, but why would they say that in 1993, that theism, a belief in a personal God, monarchism, and fascism, uh, no longer, they're, they're marginal realities in the world and not worth discussing in a, a scholarly study of, uh, of politics. Uh, well, part of that, I think, was wishful thinking. Uh, uh, kind of bias against religion that we have been in. I live in a world where people are constantly talking about going back to the vision of our founding fathers and returning to the great Christian traditions of the past. So I like to uh, quote James Madison and the famous Federalist 10 to them, who says that uh, a zeal for differing opinions concerning religion has divided mankind into parties and flamed them with mutual animosity and rendered them much more disposed to vex and oppress each other than to cooperate for their common good. And that's been a fact of religious life, that it has often been a cause of many problems uh, in the world. Uh, but there, I think over the last, uh, uh, since 1993, uh, there have been in the last two decades uh, a recognition that 
while religion has often been a part of the problem in the world, it also has resources. I, uh, on one of my many visits to China and one of my many visits to the uh, headquarters of the State Administration for Religious Affairs in Beijing, uh, right after I read the uh, introduction to the 93 volume in, in the early 90s, I was talking to a young uh, government uh, official, a Communist Party member uh, in Beijing, who told me that when he first started studying for leadership in the Communist Party in China, uh, the party line was, uh, religion is a bad thing, we've got to get rid of it. He said, when, then when he got into uh, actual leadership, they started to say, we're not going to be able to get rid of it, we have to tolerate it. And he said, today, uh, the official line is, uh, we cannot promote social harmony, and the term there is a Confucian one, uh, we cannot promote social harmony uh, without the active, uh, an active partnership uh, with religion. And even though there has been uh, a lot of um, very oppressive stuff recently, a good friend of mine, the pastor of the largest uh, officially sanctioned uh, Christian church in China, uh, was arrested recently. He's just been released, but he's under house arrest now, and that's probably going to go on for a while. And that's one example among many. But at the same time, the Chinese government is setting up, uh, even though they had condemned Confucianism during the Cultural Revolution, they're setting up, uh, setting up uh, government-sponsored institutes for the study of Confucianism uh, because they see the importance of drawing on religious ideas in order to promote uh, social, social harmony. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it was amazing that in 1993, the editors of that volume uh, did not uh, sense the emerging importance of Islam, not only in uh, global uh, affairs, uh, but also here in the United States. Uh, and, and to see new communities of scholarship, uh, new communities of scholarship uh, in places, uh, religious places, where in the past uh, there had not been much. Uh, those of us in the evangelical world uh, see the October 2000 issue of, uh, of the Atlantic where Alan wrote the, uh, uh, the, the cover story on the uh, opening of the evangelical mind. Uh, I've spent the last couple months, uh, several days at Brigham Young University, I think uh, one could write a piece on the opening of the, the Mormon mind. Uh, wonderful scholarship and uh, scholarship being published by university presses. Uh, we're seeing in many ways a, uh, a renewal of scholarship in the religious world uh, and uh, pressing issues today about uh, religious freedom, about uh, gender, and a number of other issues that are crucial to the health of our society uh, in which religion uh, actually has a role in popular culture, uh, but also is being attended to in many new scholarly uh, publications. I think uh, this is an exciting time for religious scholarship as someone from the evangelical community and someone who's worked very closely with the LDS, the, the Mormon community in recent years, if, if there's a challenge, it's not a lack of religious scholarship that is respected in the larger academy, but it's a gap between the uh, intellectual elites in those communities and the grassroots, and many of us are going to have to face uh, that one. But uh, this is a very important time to be having uh, this discussion today, and I'm just delighted to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks. Um, I uh, spent the first 12 years of my life and education in a parochial school institution in Brooklyn, um, uh, not far from a high school uh, that produced three United States senators simultaneously, one of whom's name is Sanders, but let's not talk about that uh, <laughs> just now. But um, I, I, I learned in the, during the three hours of morning discussion, which took place entirely in Hebrew, or in the case of Talmudic studies in Aramaic, or the reading was in Aramaic, that um, uh, debts are not paid until um, spoken of or discharged publicly. Um, and so I, I'm thrilled uh, to be here, notwithstanding the fact that I've not earned my place on this uh, podium by my scholarship, which has not been principally about uh, religion. But the debt I, as a friend, um, but also as an admiring colleague, owed a uh, citizen, Alan Wolf, um, is profound. 
Um, and I just want to thank you um, for that um, friendship, colleagueship, and intellectual inspiration. And it's about that intellectual inspiration that I want to, to speak. Um, Alan's worked on um, a very great range of subjects, uh, democracy, civil society, morality, evil, um, liberalism, and religion. And it's about liberalism and religion um, that I uh, wish to speak, um, and in particular about um, a concept that I've uh, been th thinking quite a lot about these days, a uh, concept of toleration. Um, but backing up half a step to the subject matter before us, the, uh, the status of the study of religion um, in the social sciences and law, um, I, um, I simply want to report, and not just as a sales pitch, um, uh, about this book called Religion and Democracy in the United States, Danger or Opportunity, edited by uh, Alan Wolf, and I'm pleased to say myself, um, which was the product of a task force of the American Political Science Association uh, that I appointed when I was president for a year, um, precisely um, out of the sense that um, study of religion um, stood uh, rather to the side of um, uh, the, the mainstream discourse in the profession. Um, I, um, I'm not here to give a bibliographic account of where we are. Um, I think there's some stunning scholarship about religion and American democracy, and, but the degree of integration at the center is at best uneven, um, following the previous um, remarks. But what was so um, striking about uh, the experience for me that um, I had uh, working with Alan, who chaired this task force, um, what was so striking to me was the price paid by uh, the absence of making considerations of religion a constitutive feature of almost any fundamental subject to do with American political life, including um, those core features of liberal democracy to do with questions and contestations about rule of law, individual rights, uh, government by consent, um, political representation. If those are the four core values of the Western liberal tradition, it is simply impossible, impossible um, to say anything of um, any consequence without grappling with um, the world, the modern world, that was born in the age of uh, Reformation and Counter-Reformation, um, because that was the age out of which liberalism and the Western liberal tradition was born. And therefore, um, from the start, the Western liberal tradition has had to grapple with, um, and reciprocally, religion has had to grapple with liberal views um, about the character, standing, meaning, opportunities, and dangers associated with faith and faith communities, including potentials for violence. Um, the, and it's there that the, it's in this respect that um, uh, the word toleration, uh, it seems to me, is of profound importance. And it's a word, um, even if I were to do a hermeneutical exercise on Alan's um, brilliant and copious writings, I don't know how often the word would appear, but the concept underpins uh, his work. Um, and it, it has a, and I would distinguish toleration from tolerance. Uh, I think of tolerance as an outcome um, in which people treat each other decently irrespective of different beliefs. But toleration is a, a policy or a practice. It, it exists when, imagine that there are two groups, A and B. Uh, a dislikes B for whatever reason. They don't like how B worships God. Um, and A has power to do harm over B. But A, in an act of self-abnegation, does not do harm to B. That's not warm and fuzzy multiculturalism uh, or an embrace, but it's not a killing field. It is um, a, a form of decency. And the, that form of decency is what we often most lack in uh, civil, political, uh, religious life. Um, and the central question, a central question, that vexes any of us 
um, including Professor Wolf, concerned with the relationship of liberalism and religion um, is the standing of toleration. And if I may end by simply saying toleration itself is um, both a conceptual idea, but especially an institutional set of practices. Um, conceptual, just as I said, because it has meaning located on a spectrum between um, violence, evil, hatred, um, and uh, love, um, embrace, and warm respect. It's in a zone in between where most of humanity lives. Um, but it's also, as John Locke understood in his letter concerning toleration, as Tocqueville understood in Democracy in America when he discussed the status of Catholicism in a Protestant country, um, and um, as John Rawls understood um, in his uh, late work on political liberalism in which he asked how can people with incommensurable values live a common public life. Toleration is not just an idea, it has to be instantiated institutionally, whether in notions of separation of church and state, as for Locke, or as for Rawls, in institutional arrangements that allow people with incommensurable differences to nonetheless share a public sphere. And it's that zone of questions that um, I was inspired to think about reading the, I think I've read the full book corpus of, of Alan Wolf. I can't say I've read every one of his brilliant book reviews um, or, or articles, but there simply is no more powerful imagination in our scholarly or public life about such fundamental themes as uh, religion, danger or opportunity, as toleration in the nexus of things um, we value um, in a liberal politics and society. So thank you, dear friend. Well, I Um, so I'm, I'm delighted to second everything Ari has just said. I'm thrilled to be here to celebrate Alan's career. I'm much more ambivalent about celebrating his retirement, um, except that I have some reason to believe that it's an exercise of autonomy on his part, and if one does believe in autonomy, then one should celebrate choices that friends <laughs> make, uh, including retiring. Um, but certainly Alan's friendship and work have been very powerful. Um, I want to take my 10 minutes, and I hope you'll call me when it is right. 10 minutes, I'll, I'll do that. Um, to raise two questions. Um, I mean, there has always been a scholarship of law and religion, um, and especially at the University of Texas when Doug Laycock was there, uh, one could say that Texas uh, was one of the centers, anywhere Doug uh, is, is a center of scholarship on law and religion. He was a great influence on me, um, as Michael McConnell has also been. Um, Antonin Scalia's most important decision in many ways in his long tenure in the Supreme Court was the Smith case in 1990, in which for a majority of the court, he basically neutered the free exercise clause and said that in this particular case, Native Americans who had lost their job because of ingesting peyote in violation of Oregon's drug laws could indeed be fired and therefore were ineligible for unemployment compensation and indeed might even be subject to Oregon criminal law under their drug laws because the anti-drug laws were neutral laws of general application and the fact that they were applied uh, in this case against Native Americans um, um, carrying out what they viewed as religious duties uh, or ceremonies or rites uh, was irrelevant. Um, this case, as has been pointed out by other members of the Supreme Court, 
um, or this decision was reached without briefing or argument before the court. If one objects to sloppy legislative process, then there are few cases sloppier than the Smith case in terms of the judicial process. But in any event, there were five votes for that proposition. Um, and uh, the most important consequence of that case was the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, RIFRA, um, passed almost unanimously by Congress, signed by President Clinton, though it had been supported by President George H.W. Bush. Um, and partly under the influence of Doug Laycock, I was a strong supporter of RIFRA. Uh, 25 years later, I have my doubts, um, though I've not yet gone over to be an active opponent. But it is very, very clear that what in the early 90s was viewed as a measure of tolerating, even cherishing, quite marginal and frankly, quite small groups in American society. Think of the Amish, think of Native Americans, think of uh, Jehovah's Witnesses or other relatively small groups, some of whom like the Amish were distinguished by their total uninterest in participating in politics. They wanted to be a withdrawn community that would be protected against certain invasions by the outside world rather than to exercise any genuine power in the political world. 25 years later, it's clear that's not the world we live in. It is very clear that RIFRA is one of the most important statutes passed by Congress in the last 50 years. It is clear that RIFRA has what one might call penumbras and emanations going way beyond what most, though not all of its supporters, um, thought would be the case um, um, in 1993. And I suspect that if you had polled supporters of RIFRA, relatively few of us, uh, though Doug Laycock may be an exception, relatively few of us would have said, well, RIFRA will end up protecting business corporations um, um, in the treatment of their own employees with regard to access to contraception. Um, that's not what we were thinking of. What we were thinking of was the power of the state coming down on vulnerable individuals who had certain claims to uh, what might be termed conscientious objection, but of course, um, Hobby Lobby is one of the major decisions of the last several terms. It's not a Constitution-based decision because the Constitution, thanks to Antonin Scalia, provides extraordinarily little protection for free exercise of religion. But, the, but RIFRA arguably provides too much protection. I mean, what the court had done rather clumsily in the run-up to Smith had tried to figure out those occasions in which religious claims would be honored and those occasions in which the claims of general civil society uh, would predominate. Uh, the language of RIFRA seems more categorical and in Hobby Lobby, uh, the court uh, protected Hobby Lobby, a, if you can, how you describe it, it's either a corporation or a closed family corporation, which would restrict uh, the impact. Uh, but it did announce in some ways a quite different regime from that that had obtained in the uh, 80s and was disrupted or overthrown, arguably, uh, by Smith. Um, and to put it mildly, I think there is a great deal of dissension, not only within the society at large, but also within the legal community, um, about the special claims that those who assert religious values or religious identity have against the general claims of civil society to demand obedience to law. Before I shift into the second comment I want to make, let me say that I continue to be genuinely perplexed, as I have for many years, as to why religious claims should be treated specially 
as against general claims of conscientious objection, which could, of course, be thoroughly secular in their origins, um, Kant, Rawls, or wherever. If the religious do have some sort of right to special treatment, of course, I have come to the conclusion that it's a conflict of laws issue, that if you feel required by a divine presence to act in a certain way at pain of punishment, then I'm quite willing to address the argument that the secular state should recognize those sorts of conflicts and in a variety of contexts honor the claims of the person who genuinely feels to take the most dramatic instance, think of Jehovah's Witnesses in this particular case with regard to blood transfusions, who might fear eternal damnation if they engage in what they view as the eating of blood and that a secular state ought not force eternal damnation upon a person. Um, I'm sympathetic to that claim. I don't know, though, exactly why I should be especially sympathetic to claims made by the religious when they're not embedded in notions of divine command and punishment. But say I you know, am a devout member of a given religion, this is what my religion teaches me, and I will feel that I'm engaging in sin if you force me to do this, well, a Kantian probably wouldn't use the word sin, but a Kantian could well say, my conscience, my sense of who I am, my integrity will be um, at issue if I'm forced to behave in this way. Why do we differentiate between those claims? We might say, well, the Kantian doesn't fear eternal punishment because, or any punishment at all, because the Kantian may be thoroughly secular. Um, but of course, many of those who are religious either don't cite divine command or have a view of the divinity that doesn't include punishment. So it does seem to me that one problem with RIFRA, or for that matter, one problem with the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment is the distinction between religious claims and general claims of conscience. Now, what Scalia said in Smith, and it's certainly not a stupid point, is that if you really open yourself up to very, very robust notions of conscience objection, we're on our way to anarchy. Because for better or worse, what the state does is to pass coercive laws designed to force people to do what they might otherwise wish not to do. I mean, state also engages in a lot of coordination mechanisms, but the state also engages in a lot of coercion. And so to what extent should we allow people to escape the coercive aspect of the state by reference to conscience? I'm gonna move to your second. Okay, second point, very quickly. Scalia's last notable judicial opinion was his vitriolic dissent in the Obergefell case, that is same-sex marriage case. Um, I don't particularly want to talk about same-sex marriage. What I do want to talk about was his rather remarkable overt reference to the demographic cons composition of the Supreme Court. Uh, that is, uh, it currently consists, with Scalia's death, um, of five Catholics and three Jews. When Alan and I first met each other, I think 49 years ago, if we had been asked to make a bet as to which was more likely in our lifetime, the election of an African American as president or a completely non-Protestant Supreme Court, I think we would have found both of those relative long shots, but decided on balance the better bet is an African American president. Uh, than an all non-Protestant Supreme Court. Um, Justice Sotomayor actually made reference to this in a talk last week. Uh, and she pointed out that if Merrick Garland, or in, indirectly she noted, if Merrick Garland makes the Supreme Court, 
uh, then the Supreme Court will be five Catholics and four Jews. Uh, still no Protestants. Is this relevant? Um, Justice Scalia stopped speaking to Jeff Stone for a while, his former colleague at the University of Chicago, and I think he stopped going, attending events at the University of Chicago when Jeff was gonna be around because Jeff was tactless enough to make some reference to the demographic composition of the Supreme Court. Um, and a number of the notable five to four decisions have been five conservative Catholics versus three Jews and Justice Sotomayor. Now, is this indelicate and tactless to note, or should political scientists, I'm also a political scientist as well as a lawyer, should political scientists actually take note of such facts? Is it relevant, as Justice Scalia suggested it was relevant in the Obergefell dissent, that there were no evangelical Protestants on the court? Um, is it anything more than a factoid if the court becomes five Catholics and four Jews? Or is religion does, does religion genuinely constitute the identity of many, many of our fellow Americans and including their identity as judges? So that just as political scientists will study political party identification, gender, age, region, God knows what. We have all sorts of variables we can dice and slice with regard to explaining political behavior. Is religion something that we want to look at in explaining political behavior. We certainly do that when you know, assessing Ted Cruz's impact among evangelical Protestants. Should we step back? Should we, you know, who study courts for a living, step back in the name of some kind of delicacy and say, no, we really shouldn't take account of the fact that we have uh, we might have, if a girl makes it, five Catholics and four Jews, and maybe the court would be different if we had a Protestant or two. Uh, and you probably need at least two Protestants in order to capture the range of views within American What about the Mormons? <laughs> uh, usually we had nine <laughs> Protestants. Um, but in all seriousness, what ought we make and how ought we publicly discuss as public intellectuals or disciplinary political scientists this really quite remarkable fact about the contemporary American Supreme Court. Well, thank you. I think that puts on the table uh, the real complexity, the concrete complexity of issues of toleration. Uh, it's <laughs> when you get down to brass tacks, uh, it's those complexities I think that bring to life the political the political meaning of religion in a liberal society like ours. But I, I invite you to respond to each other and then we'll, we'll ask the, uh, the audience to participate. I, I tell my students in uh, political science and history that in social sciences there's only one, ultimately one good question, and that is the under what conditions question. <laughs> so under what conditions, you're asking, should religious identity uh, matter um, both to the behavior and the study of behavior of key people in uh, ce a central institution like the Supreme Court. Um, under what conditions should religion enter as a constitutive central subject of scholarship and under what conditions not? But I w in, in hearing my colleagues talk, I was um, really struck by a, a number of I implicit um, uh, uh, questions. Um, one of which has, is, is in the language of, um, again, John Rawls, who I, I don't quote every day, but <laughs> already quoted today, um, uh, uses the phrase in his late work, um, reasonable pluralism, um, and um, which is a, obviously, he valued um, heterogeneity of uh, of faith, of values, of uh, dispositions, of ideology, of orientation, the very robustness without which uh, democratic and liberal democratic life would be impossible. But he added the word reasonable. 
And the question I would pose to us um, is how we would think about that idea. That is, what constitutes the boundary between reasonable and unreasonable um, pluralism? Um, the, for Rawls, um, and I'll stop with this, I really want to hear more from my colleagues. Um, uh, the boundary, as I understand it, and it's not a language he used, is between, is, is a distinction between zones of life, could be family, could be faith, which are characterized by the absence of an obligation to give reasons. Um, if I worship God in a certain way, I don't have to explain to someone else of, of an, in my own or another faith how and why I worship in a certain way. But in the public sphere, a democratic public sphere is entirely based on giving reasons, including in the Supreme Court. So how do we think about the, the fuzzy boundary, the frontier between zones of life characterized by the requirement to give reasons and zones of life where the very um, quality of um, a, a politics, society, um, social relations depends on having zones where giving reasons to others is not required. And what um, Rawls insisted on was that when um, different faith communities enter the public sphere, they not only have to give reasons, but they have to respect the provisionality of outcomes. Um, and the, uh, but the cases you cite, Justice Scalia, with whom in my past life I used to drive a nursery school carpool because whenever there was a, at the University of Chicago, in Chicago, a, a, one of the four Katz Nelsons reached nursery school age, um, there was always a Scalia. Because there, are, <laughs> there are many of them. Um, uh, but the so, uh, but in, in the cases of um, uh, that you you mentioned, precisely turn it seems to me, um, as well as the reference to the the religious composition of the court, turn on this boundary question, um, this fraught boundary zone, where the not giving and giving reasons. Um, worlds overlap and sometimes in complicated ways mutually constitute each other. You know, I, I, there are a number of, of uh, polarities or tensions that, that we're getting at here. I mean, Professor Levinson, you, uh, you seem to imply at one point that you're more impressed with, say, the rights of religious groups if they're not very big. Uh, as soon as you get big, you know, and, and so, uh, you know, we could think not only of Jehovah's Witnesses and blood transfusions and, uh, you know, where we've had these accommodations that you make the child of uh, the, the ward of the state temporarily and, and that kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, snake, ha snake handlers uh, and, uh, you know, various groups and, and uh, peyote, the use of peyote in Native American religious ceremonies. Uh, but, but if you start to get big and you have Catholic universities and, uh, uh, evangelical, you know, regent universities and the like, uh, then you start to get suspicious. But that's precisely the, th those groups who will, who will be able to make the reasonable case. I mean, it's, you don't get a lot of uh, snake handling uh, law professors uh, who know how to make a case for what they're doing. And frankly, there aren't a lot of Jehovah's Witness uh, political scientists. Uh, but there are a lot of Catholic and, and Lutheran and, and, and yeah. many others. Uh, so I'm a little puzzled about uh, why is it that, I mean, it, the tension is, you know, on, on one hand we're saying uh, we'll, we'll respect your right as long as you're not very influential, uh, but on the other hand, uh, we'll respect your right if you can make a reasonable case for what you're doing. And uh, that seems to me to be a kind of tension here that I, I don't know quite how to handle. Uh, um, I think I somewhat disagree with, with Ira's formulation of it, because I think that religious people give reasons. It's simply that they're not reasons that are going to be persuasive to, to secular um, to secular audience. I mean, the reason is um, what part of you know, this commandment from Leviticus or some other privileged source do you not understand? 
Um, and the response to that, I think, isn't that this isn't a reason, it's that you don't recognize it as a dispositive reason um, um, and the like. The, the question you ask, I think, is a very real question. Um, I mean, what comes to mind is the difficulty over um, toleration of speech and the queer and present danger test. So one paradox of that test, which was kind of operative for at least 50 years or so before the Supreme Court modified it a bit, um, is that we will tolerate seditious speech so long as practically speaking, there's no great likelihood that right. it's going to eventuate in an attempt to engage in the violent overthrow of the state. As you move toward armed insurrection, then the clear and present danger test, or you know, if you're a lawyer, the imminent danger test might be met, and you crack down. I think that, I think it's fair for you to, you know, even to accuse, though you weren't adopting accusatory no. tone, that, that people like me who supported RIFRA did it because of a view that the social costs would not be very high. Right. That we were talking about relatively small, vulnerable minorities who presented no threat to the general social fabric and a decent liberal society should have space in it to tolerate people whose views, you know, at the far end I regard as crazy, a little bit more tactfully, were based on, you know, a metaphysic that isn't mine, but what harm would it do to tolerate Jehovah's Witnesses or the Amish mm -hmm. or the like. Mm -hmm. As you move into much, much larger groups who are not withdrawn, mm -hmm. they're not the Amish, they're the Satmars, mm -hmm. um, who are whatever one thinks of the Satmars, they don't withdraw from politics, they vote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so at some point where they're trying to use quite sizable political clout, in order to you know, ultimately run the society, I do become less benevolent. And I uh, do wonder what the costs will be of privileging religious conscience, or for that matter, secular conscience. As I say, I really don't know under what circumstances we should have a sharp distinction but it does seem to me that no society can run through a maximalist yeah. toleration See, I, of conscience. And I think, uh, in, in many ways, I prefer early roles rather than late roles, because when you talk about reasonable pluralism, uh, you're, you're kind of ruling out the snake handler, uh, you know, behind the veil of ignorance in, in early roles. You could say, well, suppose I, suppose I'm, uh, suppose I was a snake handler, you know, or suppose I was a, I was a peyote using, uh, you know, sincerely uh, r religious Navajo wanting to use peyote, uh, but that, but but when he moves toward reasonable, it sort of rules out uh, some of those perspectives as ones that we could project ourselves into, with a kind of empathy. I think the real tension here, and this goes back to the the actual title of our, of our uh, panel, and that is the study of religion, is that on the one hand, uh, very often, and, and I, don't, I, I know this gets overused, but I mean, there's kind of an enlightenment notion of reasonableness that we require of everyone. Uh, well, at the same time, we've seen a tremendous production of marvelous scholarship on, you, you want to understand Amish, you don't have to go and, and try to get Amish young, young people to talk. You can read a lot of really good books out of Penn, Penn State uh, on this, or, or you can read really good books on snake handlers, who, people who have gone, done participant observer, or at least uh, intimate observer stuff, so that the scholarship today, uh, we don't have to be ignorant about, about plural marriage in Idaho, uh, because we, we have profound, uh, robust studies of those. 
And it may very well be that uh, people who want to talk about the reasonableness of those practices should read a half a dozen books uh, on the subject and, and, and empathetically and, and try, to, try to make the case. But I, I worry a bit about reasonable pluralism because uh, some of my people are going to be left out of, out of that one. I, and I, I, I do think that Sanford's notion of the, um, I, 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 I agree wholeheartedly with you that it isn't just those who have a reasonable expectation that they will go to hell if they get a blood transfusion, but it's any sin sincerely held conviction that has a bearing on as serious aspects of public life that I think ought to be respected. And uh, that includes kind of weird stuff by secular people as well that I'm, I'm willing to, uh, to acknowledge. And there are some weird, I mean, religion isn't the only weird thing going on in our society. And uh, <laughs> there's a lot of weirdness on the, the non-religious side as well. And I'm willing to uh, work on practices of toleration for those as well. But the Jump in on re not to uh, the word reasonable. Of course, is uh, is both protean and invites contest. Yeah. But um, I think that's a good thing. What do I mean by that? Um, the in democratic life, if we call it liberal democratic life, the strongest public interest, as it were, a sense of public interest, must lie more with. Um, a combination of um, stipulations, some of which we call rights, uh, including the right to worship as we choose, the right to free assembly, the right to speech, etc., rights and process for um, reaching collective decisions despite the fact that as citizens we have many adversarial views and identities. Um, and it's the process which constitutes the public interest uh, it, together with constitutional protection. So the test, um, and we can go back to, to Locke even in the letter concerning toleration where he says, um, of leaving aside his exclusion of Catholics um, uh, from toleration on the grounds that they wouldn't Atheist. respect local authority, uh, but he was certainly a very religious Protestant. Um, uh, so it wasn't out of pure secularism yeah. that he was writing. He was writing out of religious conviction in which he uh, said, um, every church is orthodox to itself. And that was a good. And in that sense, didn't have to give reasons. Um, in the public sphere, yes, when you enter, you must give reasons, including based on readings of Leviticus, if that's where you are. But he also said that um, in the public sphere, um, Every faith, and he was talking about a fragmented Protestant world, um, every type, um, which uh, including dissenters in, in England, um, had to live by the common rules arrived at through a decent process, which for him included parliament and courts and common law, um, uh, that set constraints and limits on forms of behavior. And it, it's there exactly where the lines of tension are. Mm -hmm. um, and the, there's no getting around it. His notion of reasonable pluralism was not a substantive one. It is not that the snake handler or the um, person with drugs in worship or whatever um, uh, uh, must be excluded from their private zone. It is that they must in entering public life uh, live by the provisional outcomes of a decent and legitimate public process, which in one Supreme Court can produce one outcome and in another Supreme Court might produce another outcome. One Congress ruled by one party might produce outcome A and after a set of elections, outcome B. And it's living with that messy provisionality mm -hmm that um, qualifies groups with deeply incommensurable ways of being um, to enter a common public sphere. And in that sense, I prefer the later roles to the earlier one, um, in, and only in that sense. Well, I, I agree wholeheartedly with you. I think uh, 
I mean, there's a great line in Rousseau, you know, we're in the social contract, where he says, that when a law is proposed in the assembly of the people, that's when I ask the question, what would the general will yeah. uh, decide? But I, I do think that the, uh, some of us, even though maybe there aren't uh, Jehovah's Witnesses or snake handlers who uh, are very articulate about the law being proposed in the assemblies of the people, uh, some of us need to think, what would the general will say about snake handling? I mean, I, I just want to bring those, those considerations into it and not rule them out a priori because the people engaging in those practices are not articulate about the, the, you know, the, uh, yeah, the rationale for, for their beliefs. Yeah. Maybe this would be a good time to see if there are questions from the audience. Yes. So, um, I'm sitting here trying to talk about a philosopher, I'm trying to a lawyer, but I think that you've been talking about the protection of the religious people, but what about the protection of the people who are affected by that? So, for example, in the Hobby Lobby case, uh, if they, the owners of Hobby Lobby said this would violate our religion to pay for insurance contraception, but the women who are their employees in the regular public civil world, commercial world, then are denied a benefit that everybody else is entitled to. And you could say, well, you can believe that contraception is a bad thing, so don't use it. Or you can believe that gay marriage is a bad thing, so marry somebody of the opposite sex. Why do you get to tell me how what I can do in the in the general public mm -hmm. sector, and and how do you get the balance? I, I had an American history teacher when I was in high school who said your freedom ends at the tip of my nose. And but in this in this kind of structure, it doesn't end at the tip of my nose because people can tell me or other people what to do and how to lead their lives because of their religion. So how do you balance the, the, the harm to, to the other person? Right. No, and I, that's an important question. And I'm going to say as somebody who represents conservative religious communities on this, that I, I think we're often quite confused uh, in trying to draw the boundaries between public offerings of services and how we configure the internal life of our communities uh, as shaped by our deepest convictions. And I think there's a big difference between, uh, yeah, making wedding cakes on, on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, being required to engage in certain kinds of practices and, and, and hiring things uh, within a, a community that's bound by uh, religious conviction. So I, I, it, it's, those boundaries need to be negotiated and we have a lot of work to do. But to me, it isn't an automatic, uh, I, I don't see the clear cut boundaries there. So I think you're, you're raising an excellent question. Yeah. Sorry, people use the term all the time. We want institutions that, quote, look like America. Right. Well, in religious terms, the Supreme Court of the United States does not look like America. Is that a problem? Or is it a good thing that we have an institution, the Supreme Court of the United States, that actually has no Protestants on it, and by and large, it doesn't come up much? I mean, you mentioned it. There are people who mention it, but in the, you know, people argue about the Supreme Court, but the absence of Protestants on the Supreme Court has not come up as a public, as a big public issue challenging its legitimacy. Is that a good thing? Does that suggest that actually, in religious terms, we've reached a, 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 a good state of affairs in America? Yep. So do we have a problem, or, or, or are we in a good situation? I mean, with regard to cabinets and Supreme Courts or university faculties or whatever who look like America, I think there are conflicting theories underlying that. Part of it 
is that it's an inspiration to look at the court, to look at Congress, to look at the presidency, to look at the Harvard faculty, and realize there are people who look like you, who made it, and that signifies simply that society has become less discriminatory. It used to deny Catholics or Jews access to certain roles for completely illegitimate reasons. Now it doesn't. We should all rejoice. But it really doesn't matter that the Secretary of Energy is an Asian American. It, that's simply a tribute to the, our openness as a society. On the other hand, another argument for, quote, diversity, unquote, and for cabinets and courts and faculties that look like America is the notion of representation, that somehow or other there is something distinctive about fill in the demographic category. And if people of that category are not found in Congress, in cabinets, courts, and faculties, then some very important perspective is being lost. It's not merely the inspirational quality of realizing that you, know, you have people of all sorts of backgrounds who are physicists. Rather, there's going to be a particular perspective. And of course, this comes up in the social sciences and the humanities. Um, I suspect much, much more than it comes up in physics. I, I presume the arguments with physics would be ones that stop discriminating, mm -hmm. not that we need the evangelical perspective on string theory. <laughs> um, um, and so then that really does you know, require asking, does it matter that the current court has no Protestants other than that I wonder in some of their private conversations, even if Ted Cruz has not made this a public aspect of his campaign, whether people in private say, you know, isn't it kind of odd that when Barack Obama was looking for a new member of the Supreme Court in this country of 320 million people, he apparently couldn't find a single Protestant who might <laughs> be qualified to serve on the Supreme Court. We're not having that sort of public conversation, and maybe it's for the best, but with regard to Hobby Lobby for a moment, if you're analyzing it, do you say, well, the five justice majority were strict textualists, and as a matter of fact, RIFRA was drafted in such a way that can support the majority decision? Or do you say, look, these are five conservative Catholics who had discretion in how they might want to interpret RIFRA, and what is being reflected is their religious commitments with regard to contraception. Now you can flip it and say, what about the three Jews and the, um, the less Catholic member, the least Catholic member of the Supreme Court from, I suspect, um, a traditional Catholic's perspective, that is Justice Sotomayor, they're reflecting their own more liberal perspective so that at the end of the day, what RIFRA says doesn't have that much to do with explaining the outcome. Mm -hmm. um, they're politicians in robes or they're theologians in robes rather than above it all and simply applying a scientific legal methodology. If, if well, perhaps it's, you know, my presence in a Catholic institution, but I'm drawn to confession. <laughs> uh, but in an uncatholic spirit, what I'm about to confess to, I don't regard as a sin. Uh, uh, as some of you know, I took a two and a half year detour from academia to serve in the Clinton White House. And one of my first important assignments was to serve as the Domestic Policy Council's point person on RIFRA. Uh, and I am a not quite indicted co-conspirator in the, in the passage of RIFRA. <clears throat> and I'm not going to make any originalist 
claims here, <laughs> although I could talk at some length about the intentions of the author, but, uh, uh, but I will say this. If you look at the language of RIFRA, what it does purely and simply is to reinstate the jurisprudential status quo ante, right? So if you don't like RIFRA, you don't like Sherbert, you don't like Yoder, uh, and so this, this raises the question of what the real issue is here. Uh, and I think this is what draws me to, to Ira's formulation. Okay, if, <clears throat> if you say that government shall not substantially burden the free exercise of religion, except under two conditions. Number one, there has to be a really compelling public reason to do it, and number two, you can't overreach. What you do has to be the narrowest action that cures the problem that arguendo needs, needs to be cured. Well then, all of the action is in the judgments that a legislator, a judge, or a citizen will bring to bear on those two conditions. That's where all of the action is. And here is my question. If this conflict is a real conflict that can't be exercised away, there's no verbal formulation that's going to abolish the tension. It needs to be addressed in one way or another. Is there a more reasonable way of addressing it? Oh, you know, I think it brings up the fundamental question of compromise and what, if you view it as sides, what is each side asked to give up? And I think, I, mean, I, I agree with your formulation of RIF originally, and of course it is a notorious truth that in the run-up to Smith, uh, the religious won some and lost some the court was scarcely the four-square protector of any and all religious minorities who made claims of undue burden being placed on them. Um, at the time, I thought that Justice O'Connor's opinion was a terrible opinion because she stuck to the formulation of one in compelling interest and then said that Oregon had demonstrated compelling interest as far as I'm concerned all she did was assert it rather than demonstrate it. I now desperately wish that hers had been the majority opinion, whatever its intellectual inadequacies, because that would have saved us from RIFRA. Um, and it would have left this to be negotiated in a far sloppier and, you know, whether we're going to call it simply sloppy or more compromising way, what the court in Hobby Lobby did was to offer a, an interpretation of religious freedom that I think many lawyers, not all, but many would argue goes well beyond the doctrine at the time of Sherbert, which I support. And uh, Yoder I'm more ambivalent about. Uh, this gets into questions of children's rights and not only rights of the parents. Um, but um, I mean, we really do have a, a kind of absolutistic notion now of religious freedom that is widespread throughout the land. And uh, one final point, um, Professor Mao in, invoked um, Federalist 10, which focuses on pluralism and endless conflict. Um, I've become extraordinarily interested recently in Federalist number two. Mm. Um, which offers a fantasied description that of how providence settled America with one people who are the same in religion, language, origin, and manners, and basically political views. This is nonsense. This was nonsense at the time. It's even more nonsensical today, but what interests me is why Publius, in this case John Jay, felt it necessary to present this ridiculously homogeneous picture 
of America. And I think it's because of a view that a Republican form of government required a relatively high degree of homogeneity so that the differences could be contained and compromised out reasonably. But once we come fully to terms with the fact of how wildly heterogeneous we are, how do you engage in the liberal accommodationism that Ira is celebrating where the losers are expected to be good sports mm -hmm. about what it is the winners are demanding of them. This strikes me as the most central issue of political theory, but also the most central issue of American politics yeah. at this very moment. And I was at a closed door session, off the record session of 15 evangelical you know, leaders recently, uh, really talking about how we're gonna handle the, uh, the horrible rhetoric within our own community on, on some of these latest issues. And it, you know, we, we did immediately acknowledge that we've been the losers, we're, we're, we're not gonna win uh, these things. I think the worry uh, among all of us uh, in that room was on the overreach question. And that is, it's, it's one thing to say that, uh, you know, some of our views are, are, are no longer going to be uh, undergirded by you know our religious freedom opportunities and the like but there's a real worry that uh, the winners want to wipe us out in terms of institutions you know 120 colleges and universities in the council of christian colleges and universities which are evangelical schools uh, and uh, right now the pressure on uh, federal loans a uh, school like wheaton college is 80 percent tuition dependent on federal loans uh, are, are those federal loans going to be taken away because of uh, uh, certain convictions that are embedded in hiring and admissions uh, practices? And uh, some of us worry about that as overreach, uh, where you know we would prefer to be educating uh, people to learn to live with civility and, and toleration uh, in, in the larger culture, but instead there's there's a sense and. So I really appreciate, I mean, I, I'm with you on the, those two, um, you know, writers that go, go with that, but uh, th this is a, a real worry right now within my kind of conservative religious community. Does this make sense? Or? The, the, that is canonical in some faiths, though not mine, uh, namely render unto Caesar what is <laughs> Caesar's. Uh, and, you know, I have tracked, as I bet you have too, uh, the, the unique stand of Hillsdale College, yeah. which, withdraw, which withdrew from the entire federally f federal financing business. Grove City, too. Yeah. Right, in order to be, you know, in, in order to be uh, immune from these yeah. pressures. And, and Bob Jones University on a very different issue. Right, right. and, you know, uh, and it does, it does seem to me that you know, once you once you accept public benefits, uh, the idea that they're going to come with no strings attached is fanciful, yeah. and so then we need to think very hard, as jurisprudence used to do, uh, uh, about the distinction between reasonable and unreasonable conditions that government can attach to the receipt of public benefits. We could have a long discussion about Bob Jones. I don't want to divert the conversation. Yeah. Uh, my wife's first law review piece was a strong defense of Bob Jones, and I think she was right. <laughs> uh, yes, over there. I'm wondering about, um, I think, a, a lack of response to um, candidates speaking at Liberty University and not examining the message of Liberty University and uh, some other evangelical colleges as far as uh, demonizing the other, as far as uh, still promoting 
uh, teaching that uh, everyone who doesn't accept uh, it, it, Christian exclusivity of uh, everyone who doesn't accept uh, Jesus isn't saved by Jesus is, is being sent to hell. Um, so I find it troubling that Ted Cruz um, apparently holds those beliefs. They're not examined. People are afraid to do it, it seems. Um, and it has such real consequences for uh, in politics. If he's the leader of the, if he were to be president, evangelical uh, end time beliefs, everyone else is damned. I, I don't see that being questioned or explored. I think there's this silence that is really unconscionable, dangerous, especially in the context of uh, religious wars, not being able to criticize religious beliefs, that religious beliefs are in a separate category and shouldn't be, you know, have to be respected, even if it's hate preach, hate speech, hate teach is what I'm saying. I spoke with someone at Liberty University just the other day to confirm they still teach that, that everyone who doesn't accept Jesus, including all the Jews murdered by the Nazis, gets sent to hell. And I think that needs to be explored, uh, that religious beliefs matter in a candidate who wants to be president because of such dangerous situations in the Middle East, Israel, etc. So I'm wondering why that isn't being explored more and what your uh, feelings on that are. Part of me wants to go back to the gap or the, the zones of giving or not giving reasons. Um, uh, I, there are many features of many different theological orientations, um, which those both outside looking in and those uncomfortable inside um, would be um, deeply concerned with. The question is not, um, uh, to me at least, um, I'm not an evangelical Protestant, is not the, the teaching, but the implications as uh, individuals and collectivities enter the public sphere, um, and then have to play by um, a range of rules. Um, and I agree with uh, uh, a Bill about um, uh, what happens when you enter into a public community with rights and obligations, which are determined by collective choice um, in which uh, multiple voices are likely to be minority voices situationally. And then you have to live by that vulnerability. Um, that's a pretty abstract uh, answer. But one more bit of abstraction, even a higher abstraction. Uh, in addition to the gap between the, the giving and not giving reasons, there's always a tension in a liberal democracy between the micro and the macro. What do I mean by that? We, we have electoral rules which in effect say you add up all the individual preferences, the micros, and you get a collective outcome. Um, but we always condition that with another set of rules, um, which whether it's the electoral college or um, uh, the way the Republican or Democratic parties have superdelegates or some form of constraint that has a more macro, quote, public interest uh, or institutional or other orientation. And um, the question you're raising is also in part about that, is what is it when each of us as micro actors have passions which not only are incommensurable but may even be to others perceived of or be dangerous? Um, what happens, how do we create an institutional set of arrangements so that when they enter the public realm, the passion may not disappear, but the danger is much reduced. Um, the danger, and then the question asked before was the reciprocal arrow. How should the danger also be reduced to the legitimacy of a genuinely deep pluralism? Um, that it seems we have two challenges and they're very difficult to work together how to maintain a society that is deeply, not just thinly pluralistic. You know, we have some people called Catholics and some Protestants and some Jews, but deeply pluralistic in terms of those who take those faith communities at depth, um, including theology. Um, how do we maintain deep pluralism and simultaneously maintain 
a deeply common public sphere? That is the central question, it seems to me, underneath the full discussion we've been having. I mean, Can I just say that I, you know, I, I think your question about, say, the theology of Ted Cruz uh, is a relevant question, and I think he ought to be called to account for those beliefs. Uh, I, I would just say that, that many of us are doing that within the evangelical community. I mean, I, I, I don't want us just to leave the impression that, well, you know, an evangelical could never do that because, uh, you know, Jerry Falwell Sr. himself, when he was alive, made a, a statement one day that God does not hear the prayers of Jews. And Rabbi Jim Rudin immediately denounced him. Falwell flew to New York. They spent four hours together and he apologized at the end. He said, I, I was wrong on that. Uh, Billy Graham said to Newsweek several years ago, uh, when they asked him about those very questions you're raising, he said, I don't think God deals with labels. I've got a lot of good Muslim friends, Hindu friends, Jewish friends, and uh, all I, I want to talk to them about Jesus, but, but I, I, don't, I, I don't think God works with labels. Uh, so they're, they're, I mean, the, the very things that you're attributing to Cruz, and I think rightly so, are themselves uh, challengeable within a larger discourse and conversation within the evangelical community, just as we're seeing some wonderful conversations that Pope Francis is stimulating within the Catholic community. And uh, uh, many of us, if, if Cruz is the, is the nominee, will be wanting to raise those, those kinds of questions. I think it'd be horrible for, say, to have a president, I'm not saying this is Cruz, but a president who says that uh, God will condemn anyone who does not support all of the policies of the Israeli government. I mean, that, to, and, and I know evangelicals who will say that. I get hate mail from them. So uh, I, I know people who say that. Uh, and uh, I, I think that would be a, a, a pretty rough president uh, to have who really believed that. And so we do need to hold, but this is precisely the point that religious ideas are relevant to public discourse and if the academy does not take those, to go back to the original intention of this panel, if the academy doesn't take those issues seriously, then we, we have a pretty tough time instructing the religious community about the connection between religious convictions and questions of public policy. But I think it's not only you know, academic discussions, because for better or worse, I think that academic discussions, especially you know, people who use the word academic pejoratively, they really stay within a fairly small community. But I, I think what's in, in many ways behind your question is what sort of public discourse should we be having about religious views? And to shift from Ted Cruz for a moment, my wife wrote a biography of Hillary Clinton for eight to 12 year olds subtitle, Do All the Good You Can, that comes from John Wesley. Mm -hmm. And okay. one of the themes of that book is that uh, Secretary Clinton is actually a serious Methodist. Yeah. And kind of what does that mean? Um, and we don't have a good way of discussing religion publicly, in part because of what I think is a controversial notion of Article 6 of the Constitution, the no religious test oath clause is taken by many people to mean you never talk about religion with public figures. So going back to the Supreme Court for a moment, if a member, if a candidate for a court has said, as a number of them have, that I always ask what Jesus would do or I have a view of religious faith in which my entire identity is constituted by that faith, then I'd like to know what that means. I would too. And I think that it would be perfectly proper for a senator on the Judiciary Committee to say, you have said this yeah. about your stance in the world, tell me, how do you know what Jesus would do? Mm -hmm. And how do you rebut those who say that Jesus would actually behave in just the opposite way? But I can tell you as somebody who has written in such things as an academic, I mean, you talk about, I've not gotten hate mail, but there is certainly a nervousness about this 
and a notion that religion is entirely private and it would be completely inappropriate yeah. for a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee to say you identify yourself as a serious Christian or as an Orthodox Jew, uh, which Merrick Garland doesn't. I mean, I'm, my view is that Garland's identity as a Jew is a factoid rather than um, deeply constitutive. But I, you know, I really don't know, I don't know him. But would it be proper to go down that road? And I think most people would say no, perhaps wrongly. Maybe well, we, we're almost out of time. Mike McConnell. Um, yeah. Maybe two more questions, Kay and John. He'd be. And why don't you both ask the questions and then yeah. maybe this, the speakers could address them both together. I'm Kay Schlossman from the Political Science Department. I am going to say one thing that's not relevant. I want to thank the organizers of this session because I came to honor my esteemed colleague, but I'm going to stay because it's so interesting. <laughs> but I wanted to key off both comments of Sandy Levinson's and Ira Katz Nelson's to talk about where did religion go in, in terms of social science um, inquiry and from the perspective of what I study, which is the the opinions and behaviors of American citizens. And I certainly noted that um, there were no Protestants on the Supreme Court and that there were, before Scalia died, five Catholics who were being opposed by three Jews. And oh, there was Sotomayor. <laughs> but obviously, the politically relevant category in this case was it was five people who had been appointed by Republicans and four people who had been appointed by Democrats. And the notion of a politically relevant category helps us to understand why religion appeared and disappeared and reappeared in the study of citizens and politics. From the second half of the, of the 20th century, of the 19th century, well into the 20th century, the relevant political categories were Catholics and Protestants. And in fact, it has implications for the charter of Boston College. But what happened was the Catholics and Protestants and their political behavior converged, and that became less and less important. But starting in roughly the 1970s, two other categories emerged that are very important, and those have been discovered. One of them is the importance of religiosity, which you know, we measure by things like how often do you go to church, but how deeply religious and how much that informs citizens um, is very important in politics. And the second is that we discovered that it wasn't the, the large denominations of Protestants and Catholics, but rather smaller groups, especially within Protestants, that were so important for politics. And roughly the distinction between mainline and evangelical Protestants. And there, that, it was something about the reality of American politics that made it disappear from our, from our social science discourse and something that emerged importantly that people have now, are now talking about all the time. Um, John, maybe you could ask a, a final question then we can, because I think we're, we're beginning to run out of time. So please ask your question as well. Oh, me, okay. David. Yeah, David, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, one point that I would like to bring to the fore, and it's come up in a couple of different ways, and that is the diversity within these various religious traditions. I mean, Richard Mao brought this up about the dis arguments going back and forth within the evangelical community. The same thing is true, obviously, within the Roman Catholic community today. When we talk about uh, five conservative Catholics on the Supreme Court, well, Antonin Scalia's judicial philosophy is very far removed from a traditional Catholic approach to these issues. It's very, so it, it, it points to the fact that from my point of view, the title of our panel here, The Return of the Study of Religion in Law and Political Science, I would want to argue that we need a return to the study of religion within religion. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, namely, to get a handle on what the internal dynamics of these diverse religious traditions are. Uh, and I would argue that, within the Roman Catholic tradition anyway, the use of reason and careful study 
is an essential part of the tradition itself. Uh, and so it's not that we've got reason over here in the public sphere, and then there's this private craziness called religion over here that has no rational categories associated with it, but there's, there's a way of putting these together so that you can make an argument that, in my judgment, and I've written this in public, the contemporary position of the U.S. Catholic bishops on religious freedom is wrong. It's inappropriate, it's not rooted in the Catholic tradition, the way they're dealing with contraception and so forth. Anyway, but these are issues that need to be explored internal within the traditions and not just looking at these issues as matters of uh, sort of where reason comes into play in the public sphere. So it, it, it's precisely um, a, a merit of Rawls to, st to agree with you, namely, and I would as well, if, even if I implied otherwise, um, namely that um, it's precisely because religious communities are communities of reason as well as belief um, and, and communities of practice um, that it's out of their sometimes incommensurable values and ways of reasoning, but it's reason that a common public reason can be constructed. And that was his idea of an overlapping consensus. Um, and our public sphere depends on having a degree of overlapping consensus. And to Kay's uh, 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 question, it seems to me it's back to the under what conditions issue. Under what conditions and within what institutional arrangements and, um, and go back to your question Rev, about the Supreme Court and its composition as well, under what particular institutional conditions does religion in the public sphere come to have a, a particular role? And as always um, in public, whether it's true of an individual voter or it's true of a Supreme Court justice or it's true of collective bodies of representatives, we all have multiple identities. Um, the question is under what with respect to when and which issues um, will a particular identity, including a religious identity, um, come to the fore? So I take it as an open question. I don't have a clue about whether or not um, uh, the justices in Hobby or in other cases um, were making decisions motivated by a particular kind of secular ideological partisan position out of a faith position, a reasoned faith position, um, or out of simple um, uh, sense that they are behind the veil of ignorance on the court and that they're making judgments on the basis of uh, the history of jurisprudence. Uh, I think we don't know the answers to those questions very well, nor should we in some sense, yeah. because they're irreducible um, constraints of the human condition. I think what's being touched on is the problem of generalization um, or, you know, at a limit case stereotyping that does one learn anything interesting about somebody you've met at a mixer? You know, where do you go to school? Where do you go? I grew up in the South. Where do you go to church? Where do you do this, that, and the other? Are, are you really learning anything interesting? or just picking up a set of factoids. And it seems to me, you know, one approach is that, yeah, you might be learning, you shouldn't assume dispositively that if you know that somebody is an X, that will translate into certain views about this, that, or the other, or behavior about this, that, or the other, but it's a pretty good bet though there are going to be counterexamples. But then people who focus on the counterexamples and who say you shouldn't stereotype, you shouldn't overgeneralize, you end up in the problem of nominalization, um, that there will always be counterexamples to any generalization, so we really shouldn't generalize at all. When I went to graduate school long ago, um, the trend in American history at that point was to stop talking about the farmers or stop talking about the Midwest and start talking about this particular block in Milwaukee. And even then you discover that there were differences among the Lutherans 
on this particular block. And I think this is you know, a genuine difficulty um, in, in all social science. Um, one last point with regard to courts. If you become a judge, and perhaps you become an academic, you're required to speak a certain language. Uh, you don't wear your religious views on your sleeve, usually. So that if you look at what the Supreme Court says, they never quite cite the Bible, or only, very, very occasionally. Whereas, as I just happened to do because I've been teaching it in the last couple of days, if you look at Lyndon Johnson and Hubert Humphrey defending the Civil Rights Acts yeah. of 1964 and 1965, they're citing the Gospel of St. Matthew. They're citing the, you know, the religious heritage of this country and explaining why we have to pass these acts that will make us a more just society. You read the Supreme Court opinions, especially in the Civil Rights Act of 64, they're deadly. They capture none of the, re of the moral reality behind the Civil Rights Movement. They're turned into an exegesis of the Commerce Clause. And so the problem is kind of a hermeneutic one. Do you read the judicial opinions and say, well, it's not only what you see is what you get, but what you see is really an accurate window into the personae of the judges? Or do you say, look, they could have gone this way, they could have gone that way. It's, there's no such thing as legal science. And if you really want to figure out why they chose this road rather than that road, it might be helpful to know, not merely that they're Catholic, but that they're rather conservative Catholics. And then you get the Scalia problem with regard to whether you know, he lines up with every tenet of the church. But the question is whether we as social scientists or whether we as public intellectuals should even be raising this question or say it's merely a factoid that Scalia and Roberts, et cetera, are Catholic or that Merrick Garland is a Jew because it doesn't make any real difference. I think difference. we're running out of time, unfortunately. Um, Professor Mao, you have the first word and you have the last word. I'm done. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. This has been most edifying and interesting. Thank you.